my name is Jennifer Tarai. I am the Director of Learning and Member Engagement for the Silicon Valley Council of Nonprofits. And um, I want to thank you all for being here today. I know that it is a busy time for everyone. So we really do appreciate all of you taking an interest in not just joining our webinar, but taking an interest in learning how to care for yourselves better. Um, we at SVCN feel it's very important that our nonprofit community, you know, is able to take care of themselves, yourselves, because without um, all of you, we're not able to keep our community healthy and safe. Um, so on that note, I want to give you a little bit of a background on um, our workshop today. Whitney Morris is yeah. a, a trainer and consultant that I met at another workshop actually, and we've uh, done a few things together now. Um, she and I uh, had coordinated a self-care workshop in person when that was a thing, and um, she reached out to me not too long ago wanting to offer this to our community again, and this time in a virtual format. So uh, we're trying this out today, hoping that you can all benefit from it the same way that the in-person workshops um, are beneficial. Um, and I, oh, a uh, couple of logistics before I hand it over to Whitney. Um, I will, so I sent an email out to everybody. Hope you got the handouts. Um, just so you all are aware, because of the huge interest in this workshop, we might go to an hour and a half instead of an hour 15 as originally um, advertised. So um, just know that if you need to leave early, that's totally okay. Um, at the end of the workshop, I will actually launch a poll, which is in place of our regular evaluation. So I hope that you'll all be able to stay at least to fill that out um, because your feedback is very important. And we want to make sure that the content we're providing to all of you is helpful and supports the work that you're all doing. Um, and lastly, before um, I hand it over, I want to let you all know that if there are any other topics that you want to hear about, that you want to learn about, that we can support you with um, as SVCN, please send me an email. I'm always open to ideas and I'm happy to talk with any of you one-on-one um, -on -one to explore those ideas. All right, so now I am ready to hand it over to Whitney. Take it okay. away. Great. Good morning, everybody. I am Whitney Morris. I am a coach and a trainer uh, here in the Bay Area, although increasingly around the country as well. I offer support to nonprofit folks, both individuals and organizations. I do now virtual workshops and I do them in person when I can. Um, and when I coach, I coach both leaders and emerging leaders. And we tend to focus on issues of stepping into new roles, maybe thinking about transitioning to a new position or just trying to solve problems inside organizations. So let's talk about self-care. Um, Self-care is <clears throat> in the conversation. Uh, we hear it in our communities. It's tossed around in the media. We hear it from our friends. And yet it still remains really hard to do, uh, often hard to, to find the time and the space. I think particularly folks who work in this sector prioritize caring for other people before they care for themselves. So today is a little window of time where you are going to get to um, spend some time starting to develop a self-care plan for yourself. And we're also going to be thinking about what would it take to shift the culture around self-care in our organizations. Um, so I am realizing that I did not share my slide properly. You guys are getting to a preview of all my slides. We'll fix that now. Quick review of the workshop goals to set you on course. We're gonna talk a little bit about how the culture and the mission that support nonprofit work also can lead to these high levels of overwork and stress and burnout. Uh, we're gonna look at how we as individuals, as leaders, how we practice and how we model self-care. We're gonna use um, sort of a five finger model to design a plan that you'll take away and I'm really hoping that you will also have some ideas from this conversation about how to share new notions of self-care with colleagues and clients. More specifically, um, to get you prepared, I 
going to tell you there'll be as much as we can a high degree of interaction today with me and with the other participants. We'll be using the Zoom breakout group feature where you get to talk um, in small groups. We will also be using the Zoom annotation features, which are a way to engage people online. And you're going to have a lot of chances to think and reflect and write. So as Jen said, hopefully you have the two handouts that were emailed to you ahead of time with the Zoom link. Ideally, you'll have those printed hard copies so that you can write on them. If you don't, we've got a workaround for that. Please do make sure you have some paper and a pen because um, that will be necessary. Obviously, given the size of the group, you're going to be muted. We're not going to get to talk as much as I normally like to, but you can use the chat to direct a question to Jen or Wendy at SVCN and they can try to help you or if necessary, direct the question to me. Um, if it's comfortable for you, I invite you to leave your video on um, so that other folks can see you and we can connect. I love being able to see the faces and register some level of connection when we're on the call. Um, but given that we all have a lot going on, we have we have children, we have loud neighbors, who knows what, um, do whatever makes you comfortable. I will say also that the session is being recorded to go on the SBCN website. So um, you should know that in terms of video. However, when we go into breakout groups, you are not recorded, okay? So breakout groups, there's no recording. Only the main screen um, that, for instance, I'm appearing on now will be recorded and saved. My last thing is just a plea for a little bit of support and patience for me. I am super excited. I love to do this workshop, but I've never done it for such a large group. So some of the transitions with some of the technology will just be a little bit less smooth than they might be if I was a pro and had done this for many years. So I will hope for your patience. Let's move on to the first activity. Take a look at these photos. Now what I want you to do is choose one photo from this group that gives you a sense of calm or wholeness. And as you're thinking about which one you choose, I'm gonna ask you to use the Zoom annotate feature. For most of you, you'll locate this by getting the green bar at the top of your screen that says something like, um, Whitney Morris is sharing her screen with you. If it's not at the top, it's somewhere else. Move to the right of that green bar and the continuation of the bar is black. You click on view options there and you should get a pop-out menu that will give you the option for annotation. When you have the annotation feature available to you, then you can use either the um, stamping feature, which I love because it has hearts and stars and fun things, or the writing feature. And you can make a little mark. And what I want you to do is go ahead and put a stamp or another little indication with the writing tool on the picture among these that uh, gives you the sense of calm and wholeness. And I'm gonna point out one um, technical thing. In theory, you learned this great new annotate feature. It might not happen this morning. What I am gonna do is I'm gonna forget the annotation tool. I'm gonna quickly put you in a breakout group where you're gonna meet a couple of other people on the call in your breakout group. All I want you to share, you can share your name, your organization, and just talk about the picture you chose, why you chose it. Each person in the group will have about um, 30 seconds. It'll be pretty quick. Welcome back if you're back. People will be joining us as they're finishing up. If you didn't get to join a breakout room this time, you will get one other chance during the workshop. So there will be a chance to connect with other folks. We should all be back together in about the next 30 seconds.
Welcome back. Hope you all got a bit of a chance to meet somebody new and find out who else is with us today. I am going to go ahead and put up a new slide and we're going to talk about why we have a need for self care in the nonprofit sector. So, as I told you, I do a lot of work um, with leaders of nonprofit organizations in the Bay Area and other areas as well. And these are things that various leaders have told me at different times as we've been coaching or working together. And um, you can see that the themes are pretty heavy. Um, and you see people really giving themselves to their work in a way that doesn't allow them to have enough time to care for themselves. Um, you know, the first one, sometimes I work till midnight just to, to keep up. I didn't want to let anybody down. Um, folks who took a pay cut so that they wouldn't have to pass the burden on to their staff. Um, people who felt that their relationships uh, were beginning to suffer and their health. So this is where I'd like you to take your pen and paper and just write sort of what your responses are to these. Um, for some of you, it will be, wow, I really connect to this. This feels like something I recognize, something I've seen, something I know. So you might write a couple notes about a connection. Um, and I'm also really curious to have you start to think about where does this come from, right? What are the sources of this? Why do we get to this place? So I'm going to give you a minute to think about that. Where does this come from? What are the sources for this? So sadly, what I would say is this is the, the culture that we've created in our pursuit of good. I will also say that these actions behaviors are not limited to executive directors or CEOs of leaders of nonprofits. We also see them in, in the staff in nonprofit organizations at all levels. Lots of us are making sacrifices in our pursuit of good because we really want to fulfill our missions. This isn't a new idea. Lots of people in our um, country, in our culture are overworked. We're not alone in this. But what I do think is different is we in this sector are often caregivers. We're in direct service and we're working closely with people who have extraordinary needs and often people who have had traumatic and difficult experiences. The result is we start to lose our ability to express and feel empathy. We can experience compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, burnout from this level of overwork. And that results in poor physical and mental health, disturbances in our relationships and our personal lives. This all makes us less productive and less able to meet the missions of our organizations. So I would argue that it really isn't serving us. I think many of you probably have studied or talked about compassion fatigue, uh, secondary trauma, but I do wanna give a little bit of um, a review of what that looks like and how it manifests in people. So we're gonna to go to the next slide. So compassion fatigue goes by, you can use a lot of different names to talk about what is fundamentally the same idea but we get to a place of emotional and physical exhaustion um, because of that constant use of empathy in this work. Um, the more you're exposed to other people's difficulties and trauma, the more you're absorbing that. The closer you are to the front lines, the more likely that it does happen to you, but just being in a culture and a place where that's the work you are doing, you're definitely vulnerable to it. And the symptoms can look a lot like this, right? So we have, 
have physical symptoms, they're giving us pain, problems with sleep, issues around attention, and the emotional pain is no less important. It can either be ramped up emotional intensity or a real um, dampening and coming down of feelings and expression. Um, and this feeling of hopelessness when our tanks are really empty is particularly scary because it makes it hard for us to do our work. Burnout is what I think it takes you to even the next level. So it goes beyond just being really tired at work. Lots of people get tired at work, but you fundamentally lose this ability to experience joy and to really have that continued ability to care for others. So it takes away your energy, but it also means that you can't be productive. You become really hopeless in a sense that you can't, you can't contribute and you can't make a difference. If you're in social justice and you're an activist, how do you do your work without the energy? If you're working with people in really, really great high need and it takes a lot of your energy, how do you do it if you've lost the passion? Here are the symptoms for burnout. So I really think it's compassion fatigue um, plus, and this feeling of apathy, the poor performance, even the sense that you're good at your job can really die. I want you to take a minute and think about what are we all experiencing now? Working at home, if we're lucky, we still have a job and we're working at home, but we're sheltering in place. Look how many of these symptoms are similar to symptoms that we're having right now because we're also isolated from one another. I invite you to think how many of these could you check off as complaints that you have or colleagues have or something you're worried about and someone you're close to, right? We have a lot of layers right now working on top of one another. So a few minutes ago, I asked you to reflect on the, the quotes I posted from the executive directors and think about where that comes from. So I want you to think a little bit about that now. And um, in a smaller group, this is where I would be asking you all to give me your ideas. And instead, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share mine and, and hope that I'm getting some virtual nods, which is in my 30 years of working in the nonprofit sector, and from working with so many different people. What I've come to see is that we have this condition of resource constraints that is really strong. We, we are always talking about doing more with less. We operate with real scarcity. We often do have less. And then often we've adopted a scarcity mentality which really holds us back. Even sometimes when there are some resources available, we still function from a real place of, of mental shortage, under constraints about how we can spend our money, pressures to hold down overhead and reduce expenses, personal resource constraints, low wages, fewer benefits, often long commutes, no retirement plans. There's all sorts of ways that there's these constraints. And you add to that this drive for the mission and the passion for the work that people have and their deep sense of compassion for other people. This is why they're caregivers. It's that combination that leaves us in self-sacrifice and burnout. So think a little bit about your own experiences. And I'd be really interested, you know, after the call, if you wanna reach out to me and share your theories of how we get there, I'd, I'd love to hear more, but this has sort of been my conclusion after many years. All right. We're gonna stop that share. I'm gonna see you all again. Um, and I'm gonna say, this just isn't serving us. Our leaders get sick, they quit. The number of executive directors that would like to leave their job in the next two years is over 50%. People of color who are leaders of their organizations are even more likely to wanna to leave. Their organizations tend to be less well-funded and they have even fewer resources. And if we get to burnout, we can't help, we dry up, we quit, and we stop. So I really want us to be able to start to think about ways 
that we can connect care for ourselves with care for our communities and our organizations. This slide really helps me, this quote from Audre Lorde. Caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. It, it gives me chills, like it feels very powerful to me when I think about Audre Lorde um, saying this many decades ago, early, early in, you know, the fights for civil rights, women's rights. Um, she's really known for how she could express her anger and her outrage at civil and social injustices. And I just think like, we can make this our rallying cry too. It reminds us that we need to reshape our thinking about self-care and come to believe that doing self-care is really doing care for the organization and for the mission. I'm gonna have you go ahead and go to that first handout, if you've got it. It looks like this. <clears throat> um, I invite you to take a pen, paper, and do a quick scan through the list. And this is what I want you to do. Circle any activities you already do. Put a plus by any activities on the list you'd like to do more of. And maybe put a star or a smiley face or something else um, by any activities that you think, oh, that's something I could try. Now, if you don't have the handout printed, you do have it electronically. You could pull it up on your screen now and still read through the list and if you can find an easy way to to sort them or circle them, that would be great. I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes to do that. If you've just joined us, we're looking at the self-care assessment worksheet. And we're reading through and selecting items that are things we can do or we'd like to do more of. I'm going to give you just a little bit more time. If you don't get through the whole list, you'll still have it after the workshop is over. Whitney, can I just mention that if anybody registered before Tuesday or by Tuesday, they should have received it in email. If you didn't see it in your email inbox, you might want to check your junk box um, for a message from me, Jen T at svcn.org. Hopefully I'm not in your junk box. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. All right. So I'm curious for people who are able to do the handout, I'd love to just see your face if you can do it right now and wave at me. How many people were able to circle 20 or more items on that? assessment. You could do 20. Let me see your hand. Terrific. How about, could you do 10? Were there 10? Who could get to 10? Right? 10 things you're doing? Okay. How about five? Can we get five? Right? So even just sort of an examination of how hard is it for you to even imagine, right? And we're at different places about ways we think about self-care and how we do it. Um, and I'd like you to just think for a minute, what, do you, what can you learn about yourself from an exercise like this? Like, oh, maybe this is easy for me and I'm a person who is on this track and I wanna do more. Or maybe you look at it and realize I'm a person like, this is hard for me. It's hard for me to even recognize that some of these um, activities would be things to care for me. Um, I'm gonna keep moving. So we're getting closer to doing our plan. What I want to do here, you have the start of some ideas. We're going to move on to what I call my two magical tips for self care. And essentially these are two things that I think you can layer on everything else that you're doing to get an extra boost. Um, 
I think of them and they are the, the two magical tips are nature and gratitude. And I think of them as like the chocolate sauce and the cherry on your Sunday of self-care. So let's go ahead and look at that now. Nature. How is nature magical? Well, there's a really, um, well, there's a growing body of research that explains to us how much nature benefits humans in our day-to-day -day experiences. We know, for instance, that wild animals thrive better in their natural habitats than they do in zoos. And humans are not unlike that. We evolved in nature, not in the sort of urban constructed landscapes that we tend to live in today. And people do suffer some social, psychological, and physical breakdowns when we live in unfit habitats. Um, nature researchers talk about something called attention restoration theory, which means nature restores your brain. It re-energizes you and it can be very healing. So when people don't have access to nature, they get really mentally fatigued. When you get mentally fatigued, you aren't as good at coping in difficult situations. You don't manage conflict as well. You're more irritable. So nature really restores our energy. We don't even have to be doing anything. We can just be looking at water or trees or plants. All of that is good for our brains and good for our health. One thing that I found sort of extraordinary was real live nature is of course best, but you can even get these benefits by looking at pictures of nature. If you don't have a window or access to greenery right near you, even looking at pictures of nature can help restore your brain. Um, and what I find particularly interesting in our context, since most of us on this call are living in pretty urban areas and our access to nature might be limited when we think about like, well, I can't just go out and walk in the woods or I'm not at the beach. Nature in urban spaces makes a tremendous difference. So I love studies and, studies and data. I'm just gonna to talk to you about one. The Robert Taylor homes were built in 1962 as part of the war on poverty um, in Chicago. And it was the largest um, housing development the United States had ever seen. There were um, 16 of these 10 story buildings and they initially were designed with greenery around them. They had courtyards, they had trees, um, but over time as the quality of life in the housing projects diminished, and of course we learned um, a lot about it, what it means to put that many people with low resources together, a lot of the greenery and nature began to diminish. But there was real variability between different buildings. So you could compare the behavior of um, one group of residents in a building where some of the greenery was maintained with behaviors and outcomes for residents who lived in buildings where the greenery had been paved over and all let die. And what they found was the buildings where folks had more exposure to nature had a lot more pro-social behaviors. They were more likely to say they trusted their neighbors to share um, share childcare duties, to pitch in and help each other out, to say, I like my neighbors and I feel safe around my neighbors. And reports of violence and calls to police were lower in the buildings that had more grass and trees. Um, so I think, you know, what that tells us, I mean, there's lots of things to learn from this, but what it tells us is even a relatively limited exposure to, to greenery in our urban neighborhoods um, can really make a difference. And so it's something we can work into our work day, um, even just having a few trees. So I think the takeaway here is if you're interested, I'm gonna give you links to more nature studies. Um, but if you don't care about the studies, I would say just go outside when you can, in wild places when you can, bring friends, breathe, and if you combine exercise and nature, you get a double dose. Um, and be thinking in your work, as again, since I said most of us are working in urban areas, how, what are your opportunities to introduce the people who connect in your programs um, to more opportunities to engage with nature, even if it's in relatively limited ways?
So as we go through, hold nature in your mind as a potential plus for self-care. Magic tip number two is gratitude. And this is another area where um, I would say that the research has uh, increased dramatically in the last 10 years. Um, each of the little sound bites here on the slides come from research that I found cited um, through the Greater Good Center at Cal. Um, they do a lot of work on what uh, gratitude does. I um, I'm drawn to things like enhancing sleep. A lot of us have challenges with sleep. Um, certainly reducing anxiety and depression, that gratitude can impact our mental health. Gratitude practice can impact our physical health, um, reduce symptoms of illness. Gratitude strengthens relationships, which I think might be particularly helpful right now, helpful now, as many of us are living very closely with people we are in relationships with. And to really draw our attention to gratitude can build our resilience and gratitude can help people recover from traumatic events. And I think that's good for us to hold um, in this time right now. So here's another opportunity for you to grab your pen and paper. I want you to make a couple of notes. What strikes you here about nature and gratitude? If this is something new, you might make a note of that. Maybe there's something else you wanna learn about nature or gratitude. So what strikes you here is the first question. And the second question is, how might nature and gratitude play a role in your self-care? Where could nature and gratitude play a role for you? All right, let's move on to some self-care action planning. I'm going to share my screen, move to a new slide. Okay, so I like these five categories for self-care connection, how are we in community and relationships? Emotion, which covers our feelings, our psychological health, our mental health. Mind, which is about learning, growth and development and intellectual pursuits. Body, which is, as you might guess, health in all its many forms, physical health, mental health to um, rest, food, care. And spirit, which uh, may for you be a spiritual connection or purpose. It's about what gives you meaning. And this is where I would ask you to pull out the second handout that I sent or Jen sent on my behalf. Um, and it has two pa three pages, but the first two pages have sections, a uh, big box for uh, mind, body, and spirit. And then on the second page, a box for emotion and connection. If you don't have the worksheet, not a problem. You can make one. I'll show you here. Take a piece of paper, divide it in half, put emotion on the top and connection on the top of the other side. On the back side, have a section for mind, body, and spirit. Okay, so what we'll do now is for the next about 10 minutes, you're going to generate ideas that work for you in each of these areas. I'm going to offer you prompts in the talking just to kind of help get it going um, because we can't realistically, 50 of us, share and move around the room together. And if you were together, I would make you move all over the room. You'd know so many people. It'd be so much fun. We can't do that. So I'm gonna offer some of those prompts to help get your, your creative juices flowing. 
Um, but keep in mind that self-care is self-care. Don't write down something that you think you should do or that your coworker does. Self-care is about you, all right? Think about activities that would bring you joy, satisfaction, peace, health. So here we go. We're gonna go ahead and start with, um, let's start with <clears throat> body. So go to your, col your uh, column for body and start to write down ideas. So the first thing I would encourage you to explore is think about rest and sleep. Most of us need seven to nine hours of sleep. What can you do to protect that sleep? Sometimes we need naps or we need breaks from work. We need breaks from all that we're doing. How often are you taking a five or a 10 minute break from your work, particularly now that you may be working at home? Where can you add downtime into your day to recharge? Movement and exercise. It's good for movement and exercise to be a regular part of our routine, but it doesn't always have to be huge commitments. What, what conscious movement might you commit to? Can you choose small ways, small walks, or big ways? Maybe you're motivated by a regime and training for something. Can you find fun in physical activity? Can you take three breaths at any time during the day? Food and diet are a big part of our health. Are you making time for food preparation? Are you enjoying the food that you eat? Can you focus on food to nourish you? Can you take a full lunch break away from your desk, away from your phone? Our posture affects our moods and our body experiences. How often do you think about your posture? How is technology impacting your health? Is it possible to turn your phone off? Could you experiment with technology Sabbath days or times? How is your use of devices changing how you sit and breathe and interact in the world? Okay, we're gonna move on to mind. How often are you learning something that's outside of your professional work? Could you read a new book or an article about something that isn't at all connected to what you do professionally? When was the last time you really tried something new that you aren't an expert in? Think about taking a class that is separate from your work life. Of course, now that we're in this pandemic situation, you can take an online class of almost anything. Can you absorb culture? Can you visit a museum online, attend a concert, watch a play or a dance performance? Can you spend time outside? Listen to music? Make art. There's so many ways to make art. Sometimes we get in touch with things we did as children or things we did many years ago when we would say like in another life. Is that something that's possible for you? Where can you be curious? What is there that's new for you to explore and learn? Okay, finish your thoughts in that category. We're gonna move on to spirit or purpose. And in this box, you can think about your spirit may be related to a religious tradition. Uh, it can be focused on your sense of purpose. Why are you here on this earth? Whatever spirit means to you, it takes some awareness and attention and sometimes practice to really deepen that. Do you have a daily practice? Would you want one? Is that something you might consider? 
You might practice prayer or mindfulness. You might cultivate silence or spaciousness. You can pay attention to your breathing. You can connect or reconnect to a religious tradition or a community. Communities, intentional communities, religious or other focuses give us companions for this journey and often help us. Do you know your true purpose? Is this something you wanna explore? When we know our calling, our mission, our gift, it can be really empowering. We all have a natural way or a gift to contribute that is joyous to the world. And sometimes we're out of touch with that. Nature, it tends to be a universal portal to the spirit across all kinds of different traditions. Are there best places for you that are outside or in nature? Locations that are peaceful that you can still access? How can you pause daily to appreciate the world? You can read or listen to people that inspire you and your purpose. Where is the time in your schedule for reflection? When in the busyness of your life and your day do you take time for reflection? Okay, we're going to move on to emotion. I would encourage you to accept your emotions. We're all having a lot right now in a very challenging time. Can you stay present to the physical symptoms of those emotions? Can you try to understand what your emotions are communicating to you? What for you helps you cultivate the positive emotions? Might you start a gratitude practice? A journal, sending thank yous, sending appreciations to specific people in your life. How can you participate in joy? Can you smile more? What would it look like to savor life's pleasures? Are there important boundaries that you need to set with difficult or negative people? What makes you laugh out loud? When do you allow yourself to cry? With anger, often we need to find a way to channel our outrage. Maybe for you that's social action, letters, donations, marches, allying with other people who share your emotions. Try a self-compassion practice. You really are extending the compassion that you have for others to yourself. Start a compliments file where you can go back and reread specific appreciations that people have made of you and your gifts and your contributions. And play. Where can you play in your life? I had a mentor coach who said, play is the nutrition of the soul. All right, we're going to move on to the last category, which is connection. Where can you be active in your community? Serving others opens up connections and tends to lift us up. How often are you spending time with people you care about and who care about you? 
can you create or join a group of like-minded people that you see regularly for a recharge? There's something about knowing that you can expect to see that same group of people and the support they will give you. What hobby do you have that might bring you into contact with your community? That might need to be over Zoom or FaceTime right now, but how do you make that connection with your community? Do you schedule regular dates with a partner or a spouse or a best friend? Do you call to check in on folks who are far away from you, family, friends? When was the last time you wrote a letter? How often do you allow friends to help you? And how good are you at asking for help when you need it? In what ways are you connecting with coworkers right now that's about how they're coping and what's happening for them and not just about how we're accomplishing the work? I dare you to ask your friends for positive feedback about you. How often are you hearing about what your gifts are? All right, so go ahead and finish adding any ideas that are coming up. I'm gonna share a screen for the next part of the exercise. So what I'm gonna ask you to do now is go back to all that you've written down in the five categories. In each column or each box, I want you to pick one. Which one would be most meaningful to you or the most enjoyable? Try to pick one that just appeals to you. Which one makes you feel good? Circle one in each category. What would be the most meaningful to you or bring you the most joy? And once you've chosen one from each category, I'm gonna ask you to really narrow in and choose one thing you're gonna start with this month. Choose one. And if you have my handout, you have these boxes on the third page. If you don't have my handout, you can put this on your own paper, all right? Write it down. What is that new self-care practice for the next month? So it could be yoga, it could be nature walks, it could be connecting with friends, whatever it is. I want you to then write down a short-term behavior activity that will get that practice going and a long-term behavior activity to get that practice going. And what I mean is something you can do immediately that's a small step and something that's a bigger step that might lead you into making that a habit. So if I said I was gonna start, you know, I was gonna go back to a yoga practice, the short-term behavior activity would be going to the website today of the yoga studio that I wanna go to and picking a class. And the long-term behavior activity would be picking, that class to take three days a week online, right? And making that longer term commitment. So I want you to identify one short-term behavior and one long-term behavior. And I'm gonna let you finish that. I am gonna put you back in breakout groups and you are gonna be talking with other folks about your ideas. If you're struggling with how to turn your self-care activity into um, a short and long-term uh, practice, get some help from your group. All right. So I will send you into these breakout rooms now to share with your group. You're gonna share your selected activity 
and how you're going to work on it short term and long term. Um, and I will put that those prompts in the breakout room. Here you go. One of the things I miss about um, real-time workshops is that I can't hear all of you chattering and it gives me great joy when people are um, sharing and getting to know each other and it's always hard to break it up in real life. In some ways it's easier just to close these breakout rooms and it forces you, it teleports you back here. Welcome back everybody. Thanks for taking that time to share with the other folks in your group. I hope you had enough time. I know some of you were in larger groups than others. Um, we had to rearrange the groups once they got sent out uh, to make it work. But I hope that that was helpful to hear some of what other folks are doing um, and to get their encouragement or ideas about what you might do. Um, this is something that I would encourage you to do in your organizations and in your workplaces. If you have an appropriate setting for this, could you have this kind of conversation together? Could you use one of the tools um, that I shared with you or one of the things that will come to you um, in a resources uh, handout after the workshop to have this conversation? And what would it be like to have those small conversations with folks that you work with so that you might support each other? in thinking about how to make self-care work. We're gonna move on to the next step of your plan, which is going to be, all right, four tips to keep your self-care plan alive. These are really helpful tips for building any kind of a new habit when you're learning something new. I want you to choose one of these and commit to it to help strengthen the plan that you've developed. Um, so your choices are keep it where you can see it. Posting a visual reminder is super helpful. It could be this piece of paper that you wrote on today. It could be a post-it note. It could be a beautiful drawing or painting or something. You put it where you can see it. Another option is to share your plan with a trusted ally. Find an accountability partner. Who can you tell you're going to do this to who might check in with you and say, yeah, I'll help you. How's that going? Another tip, this is something that works really well for me, is block out that time on your calendar every day or every week to do what the activity it is. Even if that activity is taking three breaths, put it on your calendar. Um, and don't wait. And just block out that time for a month. So it pops up for you every single day or every week or whatever's appropriate for that commitment. And the fourth thing is I would invite you to not just try a new practice, but spend time reflecting on how your self care practice is working for you. You want to notice like what is working and what are the challenges. And I don't mean be judgmental or be hard at yourself, but I mean like be curious like Oh, look, I did it those two days. Good job, me. And then what happened that it worked well those two days and it didn't work so well these three days? So take the time to reflect about how your new habits and practices are rolling out. So to sort of leave you with some of these essential ideas, it's really what we've talked about is we, we know that to serve other people well, we need to take care of ourselves. We need to meet our needs and reduce our stress. I really encourage you as a leader and a role model, whatever your role is in your organization, what can you do to avoid perpetuating this kind of culture that we often have where overwork and self-sacrifice is the norm and it becomes expected? What could you do to create a culture where those who serve are strong and healthy enough to keep doing the good work. Can you learn to treat self-care as a part of the work? 
Can you make it a critical component of your mission? I am available to you for more resources and support. My email address and phone number are there. I am going to be sending you, probably actually Jen will send it to you um, by email in the next day or so. You're going to get my resource list with links to articles, podcasts, books, other things to help support you um, in doing this for yourself and taking it to your organization. I'm also going to host a call next Tuesday, May 12th at 12, just a half an hour, a more informal structure. We can have more conversation. I'll talk more about self-care. Um, there'll be a little more interaction. To join that, just send me an email um, and I will send you my Zoom link and you can join that conversation. You can also reach out to me about virtual workshops for your organization, coaching, anything else. Finally, here is our last thought. You need to put the compassion for yourself into the equation. Without it, you won't be able to do the work. So I want you to write down for yourself right now, how will you show yourself compassion today? This is your final written reflection. What is one thing you can do to show yourself compassion today? And once you've made that note, I want you to add the name of one person underneath it. And that's a person that you can check in with or talk to after this call is over and tell them what it is you're gonna do. Someone in your household, someone you can text or call or connect with and say, this is how I'm taking care of myself today. And maybe you'll encourage them to do the same. That is the end of the workshop from me. I will stay on the line if you want to connect with me. If you just want me to um, send you the link for the community call next Tuesday, put your email on the chat and I can grab it. Email me later. Um, I know Jen wants to post a quick um, poll for evaluation. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Whitney. Um, if we were in person, I'd say let's give her a hand. I think we can, if you're on video, we can do a visual. Um, thank you. Um, but yes, thank you so much. I think that what I've learned is that I'm actually pretty good at being mindful of self-care. So I'm, I'm happy about <laughs> everything that you went through today. Um, it's nice to have that reminder, though, of how important it is. Um, so, as Whitney mentioned, we are going to do a quick poll, and Wendy, if you can get that started for us, that would be great. Um, we are doing this poll as our evaluation. Um, as Whitney mentioned, I'm also going to send a follow-up email. I will copy Whitney on that email, um, and you will be able to reply directly to her if you have any questions for her or would like to talk with her more. Um, let's see. Okay, and we've got some people putting their email addresses in the chat. Thank you. We will make a note of that and make sure Whitney gets those email addresses. Um, do you see the poll up there? I can't see it. From, yes. Okay, cool. All right. So once you're, once you're done with the poll, um, I'd say please uh, go about your day being mindful of self-care. Um, put some of these uh, tools into practice and Hopefully, you'll be able to start off the weekend on a more relaxed and self-caring note. Yeah. Thanks again for joining us. And oh, and in the email, I will um, let you all know uh, when the webinar gets posted to the website as well. All right. Yeah. Thank you, and everybody. Fine. So if you have a question, you can unmute. And if you need help unmuting, just let us know in the chat. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And it looks like everyone has voted, uh, has right. completed the poll. So I'll go ahead and end polling. End poll. Thank okay. you, Wendy. And I'll go ahead and, and pause the recording.
You don't, you don't think we need more of us just hanging out here? <laughs>